Hi, everybody. I'm Joey Ito, director of the MIT Media Lab. Uh, welcome to another ML Talks. Uh, and pe for people who are on the Twitter stream, the format's roughly, uh, we're going to have a talk, a conversation, and then we'll be op open it up for questions from the audience and from Twitter. So use the hashtag uh, ML Talks if you want to send us uh, questions or comments. Um, and today's uh, speaker is Margarita Mora, and she is a conservation stewards program. She runs a conservation stewards program at Conservation International. I, I met uh, Margarita in Cody at a really amazing retreat where we had a bunch of um, indigenous uh, leaders, um, people from Conservation International and uh, um, other conservation groups. And what we were talking about was, uh, so I, I'm on the board of the, the MacArthur Foundation, which was one of the early funders in conservation. And since the early 80s, we've been funding conservation efforts to try to protect biodiversity and worry about um, carbon sinks. And we've been doing it a lot of times at the expense of the uh, land rights of the local people. So it was basically get the people off the land, get a bunch of people with guns and protect it. And after a decade or so, we realized two things, that it really wasn't helping, it was still getting worse. And secondly, we were displacing and doing somewhat horrific things to people who uh, lived in these places. And we were kind of doing a trade-off between human rights and um, conservation. And then there was this really interesting uh, epiphany that came from a number of organizations, including Conservation International and some research at the MacArthur Foundation, that sort of showed that these uh, indigenous people in local communities were actually really good stewards of uh, conservation um, places that needed to be conserved. And so the retreat was really trying to figure out uh, how would we balance both the uh, conservation of the rights of indigenous people and uh, the efforts to cons conservation for climate and, and, and biodiversity. And, um, and it turns out that there's a wonderful answer. Um, and Margarita is uh, the person who actually has been going around in Conservation International, running that um, part of the program that actually has built the science for us to both prove and understand how we might do it. Um, she, so so I, she gave a presentation at this retreat and it was super inspiring. So I, I grabbed her immediately and said, can you come speak at the Media Lab? Um, partially because I want everyone to hear what she has to say, but also to see if we can come up with collaborations because she has so much access to some really interesting communities, but also a relationship that I think we might be able to uh, do things together with. So as you s listen to her speak, think about, first of all, how interesting the conversation is and, and what she's working on, but also ways in which we might uh, be able to augment or uh, also be uh, um, benefited by the work she's already done. So with that, Margarita, if you give your talk. Good afternoon, everyone. I can hear my voice very loudly, and I am usually afraid when that happens. So it is an honor for me to be here today to share our experience at Conservation International. And it is actually not me, the one that is running around, but I am the one that is representing a bunch of people that are the optimists, and as I call them, the superheroes that make conservation happen around the world, but that also care about people and about those people's having better life. So, you know something about me, I know nothing about you. And in that sense, please raise your hand. I am going to just ask a couple of questions. Who comes from a city? Okay. Who likes nature? Who likes walking in nature, okay? Who has lived in the countryside? Awesome. So I hope that all of you will be able to relate somehow with what I want to share with you today. Most of what remains of nature is in the hands of indigenous peoples and traditional landholders. These are the areas with the largest diversity of plants and animals, areas that are key for carbon storage, but are also the areas that are so important for fresh water and our access to fresh water, right? People don't think about this that often. Those same sites hold the highest cultural value to humanity. Those sites have the largest amount of languages that are spoken by human beings. Imagine the amount of knowledge that is stored in those areas. Last century, conservationists were awful. 
as Joey mentioned a moment ago, we were all thinking about, yes, protecting nature. Let's set up protected areas. Let's push people away. Let's fence those protected areas. And in doing that, we actually manipulated people, lied to people, and took them away from their own sides. Of course, they resented us with a reason, a really good reason. One of the things that Conservation International has done pretty well is to think about new ways of working in conservation in very different fields. And the Conservation Stewards program, which is the program that I run, was established 12 years ago to figure out how we can better work with the communities so that we recognize their contributions and efforts to humanity, and that we also recognize that without them, those places would be completely lost. My personal journey in this started in Ecuador. I am, as you can hear from my accent, from a Spanish-speaking country. Um, and I had been looking for a place where I could find ways of how to benefit people, but also protect nature. Because I was always asking myself, what comes first? Does nature come first? Why not? But how can we not think about people? Does people come first? Why not? But actually, it took me a couple of years until I found my answer. Right? That it was all about fair deals. Fair deals where communities have the opportunity to choose by themselves what type of future and what type of benefits they want from any interaction that they have, but fair deals as well from the partner organizations that work with them to make everybody accountable of what they are going to do and to figure out ways in which they can monitor progress and also decide what they do if somebody is not complying with the promises, right? I want to give you a short example on how this works. This community is in the Pacific coast of, the Colombian, of, of Colombia. Um, it was set up 400 years ago when slaves were brought by the Spaniards to that area of Colombia to, and they brought them to the mines. Some of them managed to run away and they ended up being the stewards of these incredible mangroves, right? Time went by, the colonial powers forgot about them, the Colombian government forgot about them, and actually they ended up in just the middle of the Colombian Civil War. These communities have no roads. The only way to get there is to fly from Bogota or Cali to the nearby town and then go by boat for two hours. They have no electricity, they have no running water, they have beautiful music, and they are proud of who they are. But they also need a better livelihood, right? That is why, in 2015, Conservation International, together with Calidris, a Colombian NGO, decided to partner with the community to start working in a different way. In these negotiations, the community is committed to not cutting down their mangroves, and actually to checking that their neighbors do not cut down their mangroves. Believe it or not, these are mollusks that are called locally piangua. They might not look that delicious right now, but they are awesome, right? I am Ecuadorian, and we Ecuadorian love them so much that we are actually depleting these mollusks from the Colombian side. So the community is committed not to extract mollusks smaller than 1.9 inches, and actually to put closure in certain areas of their land so that the reproduction of these mollusks will increase. In return, what they wanted was, believe it or not, to learn the legislation. That it was something that they were interested in, to learn better what their rights as Colombian Afrodescendant communities are, to learn about how to manage funds. The, the, they didn't know very well how to manage funds without creating a lot of conflict within the community itself, to monitor their mangroves so they, they would know the names of the birds and other kind of animals that were living in the area. Um, women are the ones that go to the mangroves. Somehow they manage not to sink in the mud. I don't know how they do it. And they collect these pianguas. They usually take their small children with them it is really tough. It is probably one of the toughest jobs in the world, right? You have mosquitoes swirling all around you, and they just manage to find them, right? 
The issue is that in many places they go without boots, without gloves, with any kind of security. So what they wanted as well was to be safer when working. Uh, finally, the other thing that they thought about was how we can all benefit in a more concrete way, not just the people doing monitoring, but also how we all as a community can improve our infrastructure. The communities are based in the intertidal zone so that they get flooded. The houses every single day get flooded, so they are up high, right? What they wanted was skywalks that would link one house to the other. And what they wanted was to improve their schools, the infrastructure, so that the kids could at least have a better place to go. Under these conditions, they stroke an agreement. What has happened since then? They have 30% more mollusks, which is a large amount. Uh, and the mollusks are also bigger. 90% of the mollusks that are there right now are larger than two inches, which is important for them. They know how to manage their land. They have been able to keep outsiders entering and cutting their forest. And they have actually been able to establish a relationship with the authorities. As I mentioned a moment ago, this area is in one of the hot spots of the civil war in Colombia. And this community has been displaced a couple of times. Through this agreement and through the partnerships they have actually built with Calidris and Conservation International, they can now have the support of the Navy. The Navy can go there when things are happening and can protect them, which for them is a huge leap in their security overall. What excites me about this initiative is that this was the first idea, and now it is being replicated in another community. And now the government of that department is interested in spreading it also in more communities, right? So these ideas catch up because people are better off. They decide, they conserve their land, and they actually receive what they want, not what we want, which is many times the problems that we have in the conservation, but also in the development world. Are you still with me? Do you want to see a video on how this community looks? No? Yeah. Oh, okay, okay, just check it. de pequeña la concha era grande y abundante y al transcurrir el tiempo ya la concha fue mermando y ya uno por no llegar vacío a la casa sacaba lo que había pequeña grande lo que fuera y entonces uno llegaba a la casa ve me fue bien porque aquí mis 200 mis 300 pero llevaba una pequeñita pero ahora gracias a dios el acuerdo de conservación ya esa pequeña ya uno no la lleva Siempre vamos a pianguar, llevamos el pianguímetro, hacemos el trabajo y cuando ya los vamos a ir, lavamos y vamos midiendo. De 5 centímetros hacia arriba la llevamos y de 5 centímetros hacia abajo ya quedan en el raicedo para que crezcan. Ya no matamos más esas pequeñitas, sino que las dejamos que crezcan para que no se termine, para que siempre que vengamos encontremos concha.
You heard the music? It is theirs. If you think of Latin America and the stereotypes that we only dance and we only sing and we only have fun, exactly the right place, right? What is beautiful about this is that all the songs are about what they do. And part of what they do is to protect the mangoes and, and the pianguas and, and these mollusks, right? This is just one example that I wanted to share with you today. But actually, what we have done at the Conservation Stewards Program with these deals that I have talked about, that we called conservation agreements, is to create a systematic, teachable, and replicable model that has been used in many places. These are some of the things that the families around the world have been interested in, in receiving as part of their livelihoods improvement. Um, it varies greatly. We don't come, as I mentioned a moment ago, and said, you know, this is what you need. But actually, people decide on themselves. But overall, we have seen that there are key things that they want. They want better education. They want access to health systems. They want, in many cases, access to markets. Um, they want a fair relationship and a trustful relationship, right? We do this by analyzing whether this type of approach is right, by talking with the communities, first of all, and making sure that they understand what these type of deals are about and to decide themselves if they want to join this or not. And then we design together the deal, figuring out a fair deal situation where everybody actually wins. We deliver on our promises, both sides, not only the communities, but us as well. And we actually see whether we are achieving what we are set to achieve, right? And we repeat. And we repeat a lot, because one of the things that we have learned is that usually the first time, you don't get it right. You need to sit down and think and improve. There is always room for improvement, right? In this map, you can see all of the sites where we have been implementing this type of deals around the world. In some sites, we are scoping new opportunities. In other sites, we are implementing the deals right now. And in other sites, we have already left. These deals go from communities that might not have that many threats right now, but where we know a road is coming nearby and that those pressures are going to impact them immediately in, well, in the next couple of years, right? We work with communities that face those decisions right now, where loggers are giving people money and they don't have any other options. And without this kind of deals, they would have to accept that money, right? And we don't work alone, as I mentioned before, and I want to reiterate this. We work with a bunch of impressive people that have the greatest skills at relating with communities and actually have the values of transparency and understanding of other cultures. And that is what makes this powerful. Not me, not my team, which, by the way, it is also awesome, but it is actually all of these people that are the superheroes. Ten years from now, in my dream, we should be using this type of deals to protect an area of the size of California and Texas. Because the environmental challenges that we have now are things that we need to do immediately, but we, need, we, we cannot do it alone, right? Any organization can do it alone. We need to partner, we need to collaborate with thinkers, as you are, but also with doers that are willing to go on the ground and give the best of themselves. It is time for us to recognize that the communities that own these lands have all the power, that without them, these areas wouldn't be protected at all. Everybody wins if they are better off. And when I say everybody, it's all of us and the entire humanity. Or everybody loses if we don't manage to recognize their efforts and their contributions to humanity. My call today for you is let's figure out ways on how whatever do you are doing, because after my short visit today, I know that you, you, you do a ton of things, really impressive things. Like, how we can collaborate? What can we build together so that you and I become a piece of moving this agenda forward? Thank you very much. Thank you, Margarita. Um, so actually, first, I'm, when, when uh, I think you were, limit, you were feeling limited by how much time we said we would give you to speak, so 
you didn't tell all of your stories, but um, I thought maybe I could get you to tell a few of the stories of some of the other communities. Uh, um, the ones that I was impressed by was the Kayapo Indians and also um, uh, uh, the, the Cook Islands, but maybe share a few of the other examples because I think they're, they're also pretty wonderful. Yeah, so um, Conservation International and actually other organizations around the world have been working with the Kayapo indigenous people for a long time, right? Conservation International's role there was actually to support the development of an endowment that would allow the Kayapo to protect their lands in the long term. The interesting thing about the Kayapo is that they are called the forest warriors. You don't want to cross with them if they are angry, right? How they discuss in their meetings is with a spear, and they sing, and they are marked. Like, they are fighters. They are ready to protect their land and face any kind of challenge. They were fairly isolated during the 80s and also during the 90s. And reality is that deforestation and agriculture expansion in Brazil started to approach them and became a real threat to them. And that is when they realized that their culture was powerful, but also that they needed friends. They needed partners that would allow them to deal in both worlds, in their communities, but also outside to convey their message. Um, through the support, again, of multiple organizations, they ended up creating three associations that represent them in different ways and that have allowed them to fight these outsiders' pressures. If you see the map of the area, they are just in the arc of deforestation of Brazil. They are the ones that are making sure that deforestation does not spread. What does it take from them? All of their energy and all of their power to make sure that all of us know about them respect them, and that actually the governments also respect their rights. Yeah, I can... Yeah, and actually, after you told me about them, I looked them up, and, and I think, because, and this is kind of a, a, an interesting point, because they're warriors, so, I mean, we have a disobedience prize, and part of our thing is nonviolent protests, but these, they're, they're, they're violence, right? And I think 25 years ago, they were attacking the ranchers and other people, and so, and they were kind of at war with the border, and, and, then, I, and then I read that, um, in the 90s, the government finally gave them their territory, which has been expanding, right? And the other data point that I, I heard was, so they, they, and you can tell me if this is correct, but it's, um, they have 32 million acres now that they manage. Yes. And it's just 8,000 people. So even just from a pure effectiveness perspective compared to the ineffective military and the rangers, right? And, and they don't have roads. And they don't, and, and one of the things I want to ask you is the culture. So, so the, the only way you can, the reason I think, one of the reasons I think you mentioned this, that they can protect themselves is the only way to get in is through the river. And they have huts along the river. And then they like, they spear you if you're, if you're a gold miner or a logger or a, well, is that, I, not I, that, is that? I, uh, <laughs> I think that, they might spear you, you. Probably they will warn you first. Yeah, yeah. They yeah. will tell you, please leave. <laughs> or maybe they will warn you twice. If you don't hear the warning, maybe you just might disappear. Right? Yeah. Uh, yes, and, and it is interesting at the same time because they are, as well, in, in some of those communities in the border of their land, they are just next to these new settlers. And they, are making, and they want cell phones, of course and they want satellite TV, and they want electricity, and they want running water. They want the, s the same opportunities as we have. But the, at the same time, they have found a way of being so proud of their own culture because they want to maintain that, yeah. right? So making a statement that this is my land, we have fought for it, we got it. We want to have better lives, but we want to preserve our culture as well. And, so, and you showed some pictures when we were in Cody where they had pants, but they didn't have their shirts, and they had paints and feathers. I mean, but you were saying earlier that some of them walk around town yeah. with, their, with their colors, uh, when, right? Whenever, like they, over the years, they have managed to send people from their communities to the cities. They have lawyers, they have accountants, like very qualified people, right? And when they need to make a point and they need to talk to the government, they will arrive with all of their tradition in place, showing that they are the warriors, that that, that, that hasn't changed, mm -hmm. and that they are walking in town around 
the, like, like this, so that people recognize that they are Kayapo, they are proud, mm -hmm. and that is their strength. And, and I think, you know, whether they're warriors or not, that seems to be one of the key things also is the dignity, right? Yeah. So that they're partially successful because they have dignity, and a lot of this restoration of rights, I mean, one of the fundamental uh, pieces is, is, is human dignity, and, 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 and I, I guess one of the questions that I have, and you, you sort of touched on it, is as they become endowed with funds, um, have iPhones, get pants, start, you know, that, how is it changing their culture? And do you think that there's a point where it collapses, or do you think it, what's your, I mean, I know you can't predict it, but where do you see that developing as you talk to the young people? Yeah, colleagues that have worked with them for a while, and also colleagues from our own team at the Global Conservation Fund, when talking with them about this, um, the Callapo have made a decision. That is, that is not just flowing and happening, but they made a conscious decision that what they want is to protect their culture. Mm -hmm. What they were afraid of is that it would vanish with all of these things. So they have put in place rituals that are traditional, where everybody paints themselves and everybody's part of it, so that nobody forgets what they are about. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, so, and, and I was looking at um, Chris Filardi, who, who you work with at, at Conservation International. He had some slides, and, and they were saying that 24% uh, uh, of all above ground carbon is stored in uh, land that's controlled by indigenous people and local communities. And so a lot of this is in Amazonia, and they're really protecting the vanguard of that, right? Um, but a lot of the uh, biodiversity, they said 85% of biodiversity, uh, uh, des land designated for biodiversity conservation, 85% is protected or is on uh, indigenous people and, and local community land, which is huge. Um, a lot of this is over the water, right? And, and I think you also work with the uh, Maoris in um, um, the Cook Islands. And I, can you talk a little bit about that story? Because I think that's also quite amazing. And, and Kevin Esfeld here has just come back meeting with, from, with the Maoris in New Zealand. So I want you to connect with him because we need to become friendly with them. Yeah. So I am learning about the Pacific Islands. And it is this amazing region of the world where people have been living for 40,000 years, where traditions have been spread from one island to the other, and actually they have been maintained until we see them today, right? In the case of the Cook Islands, um, they have this traditional governance body that is called the House of Airiki, where the chiefs of the different islands meet and make decisions on how they want to manage their land. They decided that they wanted to protect the waters around them because that is their livelihood, right? And 90% of the people in the Cook Islands are indigenous. So they raised their voice and they decided that they wanted to create Marae Moana, which is one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. Within this protected area, Around their islands, they decided that they were going to be fully protected, that no activity was going to take place. And they are right now defining how they are going to, to work. They have a plan, but exactly how that is going to work and who is going to make some of the additional decisions, they are, they are working in that, right? Um, what is mind-blowing in this type of initiative is that in the, in the Pacific, they have this thing that they call the coconut phone, right? where what happens in one island or in, in what group of islands, the other ones know and the other ones want to have the same. So it has raised a lot of attention from the neighboring countries as well to see whether they can do something similar. And you might tell me like, oof, that sounds awesome, that is in the end of the world, right? Why should I care about it? Do you, who, okay, so let, let's ask another question because I, I feel it is the right time. Who likes tuna? Good. Actually, between 40 and 60 percent of all the tuna that we consume worldwide crosses this region and reproduces in that area. With climate change, the tuna migration is going to go to the south. So basically, by protecting this area and improving the fishing, the fisheries in, in this area, 
we are ensuring that we are going to have tuna for a long time, right? It is not only a food security issue for them, it, it becomes a very big deal for, for all of us as well. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the idea to do this, so how much of this was conservationists going in and, and how much of this was taking their culture and kind of moving it into current science? It is them. Yeah. Organizations such as Conservation International and other organizations are there to support them, but in this particular case, it is driven by themselves. It's, mm -hmm. it's been driven by their needs. It's been driven by them realizing that their resources are getting destroyed. And them saying, well, you know, when I was a child, this was happening. How am I going to give back my land, or my sea in this case, to my child? Right? If I, I, I cannot destroy it. We need to protect it. It was their decision, and that is also very powerful. That is a powerful statement. Actually, this story you didn't tell me, but I heard in Marrakesh when we were there. But I don't know if you're involved, so you can tell me if you can tell the story. But do you know the story? Can you tell the story about the Maasai and, and some of the stuff that, that they're doing there? Do you, is, that, is that you guys? or? Yeah, we, we as Conservation International are, are working, and that is an interesting partnership. We are working in the Chulu Hills in Kenya. Um, in the area, you have Maasai ranches. I think they have around 30,000 people. Right? And they have the Chulu Hills, which is the main source of water for these communities, but also to cities uh, such as Mumbai. And the forest has been shrinking over time. If you have read the news lately, there was a huge drought in Kenya this year, and conflicts are starting to arise. These Maasai communities were lucky in a way because the hills are still there, the forest is still there. At the same time, um, they know that they need water for their animals, right? So what we have done is actually the first project um, related to carbon credits, to, to, to re the, reduction, the reduction of emissions on, on deforestation and degradation, right? So that in the area, the commitment is that much less deforestation is going to take place. And actually, this is, this, this is generating a certain amount of, of carbon credits that are currently being sold in the voluntary market. We already made this, the first sell. And with that, we are going to, well, the, the money gets into this governance structure that distributes the benefits among all the stakeholders including the Maasai ranches, in, including the Maasai Wilderness Conservation Trust, um, the Chulu Hills Trust, uh, plus Big Life and, and, and the government. And the goal is for all of them to benefit of the conservation efforts of the forest. Right? That is one of the ideas, but we know that that is not going to be enough. Mm -hmm. Because the amount of, of credits that are being sold are not enough for the, for the communities to be better off, to improve the management of their herds, to have better access to markets. So we are thinking on, on what can be done also from the community side, mm -hmm. um, with people that are incredible and that are within the communities are, are already putting in place certain actions. And, and I don't remember the name of the guy I met there. Samson. Samson was telling me that uh, the Maasai used to have this tradition of killing a lion as sort of their ascension to manhood. Yeah. But now they've been able to change it to being more a protector of nature and that what was neat about that was that they were able to take this ancient historical culture and without terminating it actually pivot it and to modify it officially and I don't know how widespread that is but, but, but the, the idea that you go from uh, and, and I think this has to do with uh, the, the hunting is that you're part of nature so if nature is abundant, you are taking, but then if it's depleted, you conserve. Is that, is that true? Is that, am I getting that story right? And do, do you know if... Yeah, I know the story. I haven't seen it firsthand. I know that, that the Nord Wildlife Conserv uh, the Maasai Wildlife Conservation Trust has been good at setting up models in which they make sure that people are proud of not killing a lion instead of killing a lion. And actually also uh, to set up a system of incentives where people are paid when a lion killed their cattle, because that is an issue that, that happens there. So they have been quite successful in, in that side. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's kind of the theme. I, mean, I, I, I won't make you tell the China story, but 
that, but a lot of them, um, we can if we have time, but, but a lot of them I think are how do you extend tradition to encompass science, technology, conservation, rather than trying to be colonial and push our thinking in. And I think that was to me was one of the really interesting conversations we had at this retreat. I think we can talk broadly without, with Chatham House rules, but, but there are a lot of uh, um, um, local people there. Um, local, we had indigenous leaders from all around the world. Um, first of all, they hated the word conservation, which yeah. is kind of interesting. I'm sorry because no, no, it's no. in your name. I understand. But, um, but they said, don't ever use that word because it's a colonial, colonization kind of word, right? And, and, um, and actually, I think we can, we can, we can say this. Um, it hasn't been announced, but so, so just keep it between us. Uh, but um, but we, we, we were trying to come up with a name for this new uh, entity that would do primarily the work that you're working on. And I think um, we didn't have the name there, but it was interesting because they didn't want a colonial name, but they didn't want a name from an indigenous, uh, one indigenous community because then it would seem like they're getting priority. So we ended up with Niatero, which is uh, our earth in Esperanto. And one of the members that's a leader in this was involved in Esperanto. But it was, but it was interesting how important the words were as well and the fact that we were going to have a lot of indigenous people involved in both the governance and the operating of the foundation as well as, as the work in the field. And I think, I think that's, I mean, and I'm curious how much effect you think that transformation is going to have and whether being part of a large, I don't want you to say anything bad about Conference Reservation International, but just in terms of the, because you ran this, program inside of a much larger organization that's been for decades mostly about scientists going around and, 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 and just looking at the bugs and the, and, and, and the CO2 sensors, right? Yes, I know. Yeah, but, but the, the people that I work with, we hold a, a, a meeting, right? We invited 60 people around the world to come to actually decide in, in Colombia. People from Botswana and from China and from Cambodia and from Guatemala, other parts of the world. And within those, there was not a single scientist, but people that actually care about other people. And at one point, they were not even talking about nature. And I was like, OK, OK, remember, <laughs> remember. Yes, we want people to be better off, but remember that, that nature is also important, right? Yeah. So, so I think that there is a switch not only within CI uh -huh. that has started already for a long time, but in other organizations as well, where we recognize that reality is that the only way to protect what is left yeah. is with people. Yeah. But so, so in a sense, this is also going to be a challenge because you have the whole sort of human rights community, which was really didn't care about conservation. And um, the conservation people who, you know, I, I sort of exaggerate, but mostly didn't care about humans. Um, but by the way, I'm going to tell a little story. I was just in, in Japan uh, a few months ago, and I had a bunch of junior high school students who were in a cram school wearing, you know, uh, Japanese you know, school outfits. And, and I said, hey, let's talk about conservation in, in the environment. And uh, the first question was from a little boy, and he said, um, so do you mean with people or without people? And it was exactly the question, right? Because most conservation was kind of mutual of Omaha, let's think about it without people. But in fact, we're here, so we have to design it with people. So I said, let's think about with people because we're gonna be the designers. And the next question was uh, a young uh, girl, uh, and she said, well, but don't we have to talk about what the meaning of life is first? And, and that was really, really impressive for me because I didn't expect a bunch of kids cramming for uh, their high school exams to be asking these basic questions. But those are, I think, the basic questions that we didn't ask in conservation. So we had all this conservation without people. And then we also didn't really think about what, why we're doing this. What, how, like MIT talks about make for a better world, but I always ask for who and in what time scale. Right, because that's kind of pretty fundamental. And I think one of the interesting things about indigenous people, so in Japan we have the Shinto people, which, which Andre's working on. I mean, we, they've been there in Issei Shrine for 2,000 years without growing, but they're happy and they are flourishing. And so for me, the flourishing world, word is really important because there you have a meaning of life that doesn't include trying to be greedy, trying to get more stuff, having a bigger house than the next person. Ishtay Shrine rebuilds itself every 20 years with trees that they cut down that they have planted hundreds of years ago 
in lots that rotate around just to remind them that it's all about cycles and that you rebuild and you put energy in but it's always the same size and you're happy that it's the same size. And so one of the other things that I'm curious about as you start to work with these communities is this kind of, uh, um, and, and I don't know if Neri's, Neri's here, so we're working on this part of it. It's like th there's probably a sensibility of being happy and flourishing in nature without, and, and more than enough is too much. And, and maybe some of these places are, have already been corrupted by our consumerism, but is there some sort of sensibility you think that can maybe be translated out? Because I think a lot of the problems that we're having right now, both in, in, in justice and in poverty and climate and in health, is excess, right? So, so is the fact that the more the better. And it seems like we can have support the indigenous people to protect their area, which I think is 50% of the land, this earth service is controlled by indigenous people and local communities, so that's a lot. But the rest of it is controlled by us. And so, so how do you think we, there's a way to inject some of their learning or some of their sensibility into our culture? I hope so. I really hope so. Because honestly, some of the happiest people I've met are as well in these communities. Like, and then you start thinking about what is really what matters in life, right? Is it money? No, you have studies that show that above certain level of income, actually the additional dollar that you get does not make you happy. And in these communities, the community that I, I mentioned today in, in the Colombian Pacific region, they have had a tough life, like as tough as it can get. Are they happy? They are. Like they, have, they, they know how to enjoy life, they are proud as well of what they have, right? And that is something, something, that, something that, here, that, that we sometimes forget. Mm -hmm. That it is not only about the destination and having more and more and more and more, but actually about life, mm -hmm. enjoying life, being with the people that you care, caring for others. That is what makes mm -hmm. us happy. And, and weirdly, one of the areas that we work on a lot is the future of work. Mm -hmm. And the biggest question that comes out is, what's people's purpose if we lose our jobs? And one of the really interesting things is, gets back to the median life, is, is if you have a community and you're doing something that's fulfilling, and you know, child re rearing and dancing aren't calculated into GDP, but they do contribute to happiness. And so, so I think some of these things are the things that we're gonna look at trying to translate out. Um, um, you know, so, so I'd love to work with you on that. Um, I'm also curious a little bit because I know um, Ed's not here, but Ed Boyden is also working on um, trying to bring science uh, to the indigenous people so that things like uh, 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 um, genomic um, information that could be translated into uh, uh, you know, uh, pharmaceuticals, for instance, that they can be discovered by the local communities and, and, and owned and protected by local communities. Because right now they're basically What's stolen is probably the right word, right? Um, how, how open are these communities to science? Have you s seen them engaging in how, what's, what, what, is, what is it like? And, and also, I think um, uh, Kevin Esfeld's working now um, with, I, we can talk about it, right? In, 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 with, with, uh, he he was, was working in Nantucket originally to try to get rid of Lyme's disease by going after the mice with um, uh, 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 CRISPR gene drive and having the, the, um, am I getting it wrong? The, the, but, but it's, I, I try to say, but, but basically allowing the local communities to run the science experiment to figure out how to eradicate tick-borne disease um, um, using a genetic uh, intervention. But now the challenge, I think, is that he's going to work with native communities like the Maoris, who are, you know, I would say the Nantucket people, you can argue, um, probably have access to people who know enough about the science so that you could say that it's informed consent. And so one of the questions that I have is when you go into communities um, that may have a different view on science, how do you get them to do uh, uh, you know, informed consent and how do they own the, the science? Or, or am I projecting my colonial view and, and underestimating their ability to, or their interest in science? Yes. <laughs> uh, Probably is not the same type of science that you are doing, but one of the things that we try to, to foster is communities knowing more. Not, because they already know a bunch of stuff, right? They, they already know. I, I was with this woman from, from Suriname that lives in a very remote community. I was with her in, in another community in Bolivia, and she was listening at the animals, and she was like, oh, 
I don't hear any frogs, and I don't hear this, and I don't hear that. And I was like, I hear noise, right? It, it, I was impressed on the level of knowledge that they have, right? Mm -hmm. um, what we have seen is that everybody is so eager to learn. If you get, give opportunities to, to people to learn, mm -hmm. they are going to take it. And they are going to share it, and they are going to improve, actually, part of your way of thinking. We had also that experience in, in one of the projects we worked uh, with fisheries, inland fisheries. The communities are actually the ones that told the scientists, you know, you are doing this wrong. The methodology is not going to work because the fish behave in this way in this area. And they were right. Mm -hmm. So I think that the knowledge is there. Yeah. It is humility from our side mm -hmm. and patience to explain what it is and actually making sure that we respect their rights to, to decide whether that is something that they are interested in or not. And that gets to your trust thing. Right? Yeah. I think Chris Filardi was talking about in British Columbia. Yeah. Um, he didn't realize until pretty far in that they were super sophisticated. They just weren't telling him everything um, until they trusted him. And this is, I think, you know, there's a legal layer, which is the, the contracts, but then there's the translation, the community and the trust. And I think what, what would be really wonderful and a way to work with you is that it takes a lot of energy to build trust in all of these communities. And I think to the extent that we don't betray that trust, I think having you help us with getting the people to help us translate our thoughts in and understand those communities could be tremendously useful because I, I do think that there's, you know, we have, I mean, we, and even when we go to places like Detroit, um, we often go in with all these ideas and we get there and we find out that, you know, our ideas are all wrong, but if we just listen to the people in East Detroit, we come up with all kinds of useful things and it's really about, um, about, about listening. Um, but, but I, and, and Detroit was also a, a really hard trust building exercise, but I'm sure for these. Uh, yeah, it meetings. is amazing how trust is built. In some places, it has taken two years just to build trust, but mm -hmm. it has lasted a long time. And it is also the thing that you lose first. Oh, you lose first. <laughs> yeah, when yeah. trust is lost, it is so hard to rebuild it. Yeah, that's interesting. I, so I have a question just for you personally. Um, you, you know, for because you, 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 even though we're these two things, like uh, the rights of the, the indigenous people, um, and conservation sometimes beautifully match. Sometimes they probably don't, right? And then we also had, and, and I'm, I'm going to ask you questions that we d weren't able to answer after two days of discussion, so it's not fair, but I'm just asking your opinion. But like the picture of all the Kayup in Indians, were, they're all men, right? So from a gender perspective, it's kind of horrible, but it's this really weird thing. And, and as a Japanese, Japanese is still very sort of behind in, um, in gender issues. So. Um, but if you immediately judge everyone, um, you can't build the trust, and you got to get in somehow. On the other hand, in America, for instance, I would never let certain people go with even a little bit of attitude, but in some of these communities, it, it's hard if you were just going around judging. But on the other hand, some of the people in the community said, no, we don't want to support any community where they don't have first gender diversity. And, and, and these are really tricky questions, but I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, or, or like if, if, if you have a community that doesn't have, their property doesn't really have any conservation value, what do we do about that? So how, I don't know, are we just going after that sweet spot where all the pieces align or how? Yeah, well, in, in our work, we want to work in places that, that matter in terms of, of nature, but also that are relevant for the people that live there themselves, right? Um, Otherwise, you know, as, as you mentioned, a quarter of the lands, of the planet's land surface is managed by indigenous people and local communities, right? So it is a big chunk of land. Mm -hmm. And we never have all the resources to do all the work. So we need to figure out where, what is that sweet spot. Um, with the gender issue, it is tricky, mm -hmm. right? You certainly cannot go into a community and be like, oof, women, stand up. Fight for your rights. Believe me, I, I, sometimes I wish I could, right? Um, because you're going to generate more problems than benefits. The point with these interventions is to start moving the needle to a place where you can actually start having those discussions and actually having very smart people involved that make sure that anything that is decided in an assembly or in, or in a meeting where only men are involved, including the partners we work with, that they voice these other things that they have heard from the women and from the youth, because otherwise, no intervention is going to work. Like, you can have 
all the Callepo men standing there for the picture. <laughs> That's perfect. But if the women are not on board, it is going to fail. They, they, yeah, there's no way out. Mm -hmm. It is figuring out how to do that. And, and I guess there is, what, what is, there's a UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, and we also have the, the yeah. Declaration of Human Rights. Th those are pretty good baselines to at least say, look, we're going to make sure you honor these. And then the other normative things, but, it, but it's tricky because it, you know, that's, that's the problem with colonialism is you come in with all of this judgment, right? And, um, and so, so, so I, I, I mean, I, I didn't want you to answer it, but I just want to raise that this is always going to be a, a, an interesting And it is problem, going to yeah. be, yeah, it is always going to be an interesting problem. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It, yeah. yeah. But, um, but I, you know, I think the thing in, one, in an AI conference we had recently was interesting is when you look, even in modern history, like in the United States, if you look at the, somebody was mentioning that they were looking at the Harvard papers written about the Haitian uprising. And there wasn't a single paper from the perspective of the people uprising. It was all about how the French could have done it better and not screwed up and lost control. You know? and, and so what's interesting as the colonists, you sort of never really look at it from the other perspective until it's kind of late. And I think this is sort of this new field where we're, 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 we're just starting to figure out in academia and in philanthropy how to do it. But even as we, there was, I just read a great book called uh, stamped from the beginning about the history of race in, in, in America. And, you know, even some of the people who were anti-abolitionists and, and anti-segregationists, they all still had these racist things that they did without knowing. And every layer you peel, you realize, actually, no, we're still racist. We're still racist. And so there's also a similar thing, I think, with being colonial, right? It might be that we think that suddenly, okay, now we're supporting indigenous people, we're doing this, we're giving them a fund, but maybe we're contaminating them with all kinds of values that actually aren't good for them. And that's also another concern yeah, that I and, have. And I understand the concern, but the reality, we were talking about this today, actually, is that the only indigenous people that probably maintain fully their traditional values are the people in voluntary isolation, right? Yeah, like Japan. <laughs> I was not thinking about Japan. I was thinking more about some indigenous groups in the Amazon, right? That they uh, uh, decided that they didn't want to have contact with the outside I see, world, I see, right? I, see. I have not been yet to one community where they don't need money in order to, to have access to health or even to, to purchase hooks or even to other stuff, right? Yeah. So, so I agree, we have to be very careful because we, yeah, the, uh, one, I, I was recently in, in a, meeting about gender organized by, by one of our colleagues that uh, is fully involved in that. And one of the things that really made me think was, well, it is not only about doing no harm, it is actually about doing good and moving the needle and thinking about how each intervention that you have is going to have an impact. If you, through these interventions, don't express at least what are the woman's desires, then you're giving power to other actors. So you have to be very smart on how not to destroy those relationships, right? Mm -hmm. Destroying is so easy, mm -hmm. and generating inequity is so easy that we have to be very smart about it. Mm -hmm. It is not an easy task. I think that that is why not many people are doing it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think that if we manage to get this right, we can face the challenges mm -hmm. that we are facing in this century. Mm -hmm. Like, I am very optimistic about it. And, and, and I suppose if we get those right for those people who are protecting important conservation land, we will learn how to then probably protect people who may not have that same double value but still suffer from some of the same things, right? Because we'll be learning things. And because and, I think it really is what's interesting is you have this convergence of two different interests in this one. And so we're, we're, we have this, this uh, uh, wind in our sails right now. So hopefully yeah. we can use that. And if I can say one more thing on that is that what we have learned is that, yes, we care about nature, but they, might, they, they care about nature in another way. We mm -hmm. both care about nature. It is finding how we together can communicate and can foster that, those same interests. Mm -hmm. Usually the same, we have the same interests. The communication sometimes is what yeah. is challenging. And with that, uh, we're sort of, if, I don't know if anybody has any questions. We can open it up for questions or comments. I don't know, Janine, if there's anything interesting from Twitter. Okay, can somebody get, oh, so by the way, th this is a, the microphone. 
I guess it's a cube now. Um, there's a microphone in this foam thing. You can speak into the mic. And I didn't even have to catch it, thank goodness. Uh, Toby asks, how do you choose and find new areas to work with? Do you go to them or do they find you? Both. It, it depends. Yeah, it, it depends on the local partner. In some places, our partners have already built that trust and they are finding ways to, to, to support communities that have to make different choices. In other places are the communities that come to the partners. In other, yeah, it, it is as diverse as the world. I have one more while I have the box. Uh, Dan Novi asks, this is a fun one, would access to space-enabled tools such as small-scale satellite imaging, sensors, or communications be useful in your work? Of course, and, and many, in many places they are already using that. Uh, and, and actually, technology is one of the, the, the most engaging things for communities. Mm -hmm. Like many of the Younger people within the communities are eager to learn how to use drones, to use GPS, to, to do a bunch of stuff that is technology, technology related, right? And I'm going to channel Daniel Wood, who's a faculty member who's joining from NASA in January. But she has been doing a lot of work with uh, local communities all over the world. And one thing that she told me, because I, I asked this similar stupid colonial perspective question, I said, so how do you get the technology there and said, no, most of these countries already have their own space program. And it's just about helping them or connecting them. And there's this network of uh, these space programs where they're teaching each other. And then the other thing is a lot of these countries now depend on data that come from satellites that are managed by developed countries. And developed countries say, okay, we're gonna switch it off now. And so NASA just creates the data they need, but they're not sort of in the job of, pro they provide it for free but they're not in the job of continuing a data feed just because somebody in a, de in a developing country wants one. So they're all now rushing to get their own satellites up. And now with these microsatellites, uh, you, you, you can actually get them up with a, you know, smaller uh, budgets. And, and, and also you can get the satellites to focus on areas of the world that the Americans don't care about. So, so it's actually was much more of a real thing. And she has like slide after slide after slide of her in all of these really interesting uh, places in the world with her, with, her, with her local space programs. And it was, it was yeah. pretty exciting. What, what I hear sometimes about technology is that, yes, it is awesome because anyone can do a lot of stuff. At the same time, that we have to be careful with what type of information is accessible to everyone because some communities might not want to share everything. It is their right to decide they, what they want to share and what they don't want to share, right? So that, that is the mindful part that we have to, to think about. Uh, yes, my name is Adrian. I am here. I come from Colombia. And I have a question for you is, um, there's a big challenge of making this type of program uh, sustainable in time because you do it uh, you make it dependable for the community of getting funds from, the, from international organizations to make it possible to keep going. But how do you make it in a way that they can produce their own funds to keep their community going by themselves? Yeah, that is a really good question. And believe me, you're not the first one that asked me this question. Um, when we started with the program 12 years ago, we were testing like, whether this was going to work or not. And we were, to be honest, at the beginning, not thinking like, oof, how we are going to sustain this over time, right? Over time, of course, that became a really important question. And it is not only an important question for what I do, but actually for any type of conservation, nature-related program, everybody faces the same challenges. We are actively thinking about it. Um, in this particular case, what in, in, in the... Um, Choco region of, of Colombia, we are trying to link it to offsets um, that might be paid by companies in Europe. So we are thinking about different types of strategies that will allow this kind of, of support to be maintained. Because, yeah, believe me, we have thought like, oof, the piangua, the, 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 the mollusks are delicious, so maybe we can get the Ecuadorian pays more for it. But all the, the, the commercialization is illegal. So there's no way that we can make that happen. We have thought about, well, you know, in Buenaventura, we could get all the mollusks and then put them in cans and send them to the Spaniards. Probably they will like them, right? And maybe that could work, but all of that takes time. And one thing that hits me over and over is that 
we always have, or not always, but sometimes have the mentality that everything has to become a business. And reality is that that is a very Westerner way of viewing things. And in some places, actually, by pushing those kind of businesses, we are destroying the, the essence of those communities. So to answer your question, yes, we need to find a sustainability action. We have around the world think about red payments, carbon credits that are actually paying for the work in, in Peru and in Cambodia. We have established endowments. We have established payments for water services. We have established a different kind of, of initiatives. There are places that we don't have the answer yet, and that keeps me awake at night. Um, the market can be super strong, but the market is not everything. Coming back to what you were saying, right? And we have to be careful on that. And I think some, like the example that you gave of the Chinese tea yeah. people, they already had a business that yeah. you just made uh, sustainable, which is another yeah. trick. And, and, and you mentioned that the, I think the Kaipo Indians also go and find reagents and other... Um, yeah, not timber um, forest products. Yeah. yeah that, and is that a sustainable process that they can, they can collect that without impacting the environment? Well, you will have biologists that say no, because they are still in the feed for some of these animals, so these animals see, cannot take the seeds and reproduce the tree. There, so there are always issues, right? how hardcore you are about um, biodiversity. Exactly. No, yeah. yeah. And, and actually, it depends on how large is the land, right? Yeah. Because yeah. 8,000 people cannot necessarily pick all the... For 32 million acres. Exactly, yeah. exactly yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the, we have been exploring the non-timber forest product aspect. It has worked pretty well in, in Bolivia, actually, for a local market. Not even thinking about larger markets, but markets that are already there. And this, most of this money is to pay the lawyers, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, we have a lawyer that wants to ask the next question. <laughs> Luckily, no. Uh, yes, thank you, Wendy Seltzer. Yes, I am a lawyer, and I, I wondered about the role of law in, uh, in, in the, the conservation agreements that you were talking about, uh, in part because I can... For, for many communities, law has been a tool that's been used against them, and uh, when offered treaties, they were often ways to, to cheat people. So how do you start out that process of building trust, and does law have a role there? Most of the agreements are voluntary agreements that usually the lawyers come back at me and are like, what are you thinking? Like, why are you not involving a lawyer? But the issue with lawyers, sorry, is that uh, in many cases, they end up putting language that I don't understand, <coughs> right? So how can we expect people that have not even English as their first language, but another language as their first language to understand those words, right? So what we try to do is make things simple. How do we build trust? Don't make a super complicated agreement at the beginning. Make something simple that everybody can comply to, that everybody can follow, and that everybody can complain about if things are not working. And you can build complexity over time. Usually, once the first agreement is done, we review it after a year, and then we improve it, and in some cases, we make it more complex. We review it and change it again. We usually bring the lawyers when the agreements are set between government agencies such as the the park system in, in Peru and the local communities because the government has to abide to other types of, of laws, right? Uh, but other than that, I always try to make things simple. Hi, uh, I had a question about what kind of thresholds do you have for engagement with these different communities? Because you're talking about needing a lot of patience for for this process. Some of these things sound like very long-term projects. So how do you decide what's gating or not gating? For what, what is the what, sorry? Threshold. Yeah. Like, how do you decide whether or not a, uh, a project is worth going after, and what does yeah. it take to keep it going? Yeah. So what we do at the beginning is an analysis of the area, right? We, we don't go to the communities and gather all of this information, but we gather secondary data in most of the cases, and we might meet or not with the partners that we work with, with, with the community just to understand where they are. So we know that there are certain things where, when, when these agreements don't work. Like, and, and we are not going to support those initiatives because those uh, analyses tell us that. So if 
The community has no clear governance structure and no clear way of organizing themselves. These agreements are not going to work and they are going to just generate more problems, right? If there are issues that go beyond the community's capacity to manage their land, for example, governments deciding that they are put that area under mining concessions or have already given those mining concessions. In many countries, the communities can do an amazing work protecting that land, but when the companies come, probably they are not going to be able to do much and there is going to be other type of a struggle. They need to be supported, for sure, but we are not, in that case, the, the right partners for them, right? Um, so, yeah, I, if, if I may, I have this story in, in Guatemala. So we were thinking in the Maya Biosphere Reserve about one of these agreements. We work there with the um, uh, Wildlife Conservation Society, an incredible partner. And they met with the government, the park service. They sat together and they said, like, yes, let's do the analysis in this community because it is going to be perfect, right? This is going to work. They did the analysis and the results were that there were cattle ranches that were drug smugglers that had other kinds of issues that crossed that area. So it was clear that an agreement with, uh, this type of agreement was not going to be the, the right fit. They needed other type of intervention. Edwina. <clears throat> I think it's a follow up on that question, but I, I'm from Mexico City. I'm happy to hear your talk. And I was just wondering what, what so, I, I was surprised to see nothing in Mexico. And I was wondering if it had to do with deeper problems that maybe you encountered that, or was it just Mexico not requesting your services? Yeah. Uh, I have been in touch with a couple of organizations in Mexico, but we are not working there, not because of the social problems, because, just because we haven't found a joint initiative to work on. What I am probably most proud of is that we have seen these agreements work in places that are challenging. Like we work in Venezuela, which right now it is not the easiest place to work, right? We work in, in Guatemala, in the border with Mexico, which is also one of those sweet spots, right? <laughs> and in Liberia. And sometimes things take time and results might not be perfect, but you do, you go, you, you Negotiate, you learn, you improve. And it, it, I, I think that in my line of work, it is not about having immediate results. It is the long term what actually matters, making progress little by little. Hi, Alan Adams. Um, first, I just want to say I think the work that you guys do is just breathtakingly awesome. So thank you. Um, so I was actually a while back uh, working at a field station at WCS, as it happens, the old logo. Um, at, in Patagonia in, in Argentina, and um, at night, um, you could see way offshore incredibly bright lights coming from the horizon. And it was from these huge shipping fleets that shine lights deep down into the ocean to tempt uh, squid to come up. In the first couple of nights, they capture a season's worth of quota, and then they're there for the rest of the season. And um, there's the only kind of leverage on um, on you know, that sort of resources extraction is on some huge scale, right? It's governmental, it's international, it's, you know, it's dealing with the Chinese fleets. Um, but it's impacting people who live in all sorts of small and personal and intimate ways on the coastline. How do you bridge those scales? And how do you bring the sort of passion and ownership and, um, and devotion that a local community has to bear on those sort of global governance problems? Yeah, that is a huge challenge, and I am not saying that, I, actually those are one of those cases where I know that this type of intervention is not enough, right? That you not need other type of interventions that might be more efficient and effective than, than negotiating with the community, right? Uh, I am sure I am not the right person to say this, but I, like in, in those kinds, I am all activists. It's like, let's call Greenpeace, let's call anyone that can sink those ships. That, that is usually me in those cases, and, and probably the government. What we have seen, actually, I don't know if you read recently that in Ecuador, there were all of these Chinese fleet just in the border of the Galapagos Marine Reserve. <coughs> and they were entering, fishing a bunch of stuff, and leaving, exactly. right? And uh, the, the park service couldn't do much about it, right? Because it, I think it was more than 100 boats. But they ended up 
get in one of the main boats where all the other boats would bring the fish. And they took it, and they put the people in jail, and they fined them, and they make a statement on that. And I think that that is where local NGOs, as well as, as larger NGOs, play a very important role in pushing those buttons from the government to take action in those cases. And, and I, I would say, I, I, I've been peripherally involved in this. Um, that's also, so this is a developing world. Now, this is China and Japan, basically. <clears throat> and um, I would say they also have the same indigenous culture problem. So if, if Americans come in and Greenpeace comes in and they beat up the local culture, <clears throat> there's no way. It goes the reverse, right? And, and one thing, so I'm a scuba instructor, so one of the things that we did a lot was we took Chinese young people scuba diving and we talked to them about sharks. And now any scuba diver in China that kind of is in, infected by our, our, our thinking will not have um, the customary wedding uh, shark fin anymore. And, and a, a lot of the anti-shark finning in Singapore and China is coming from the scuba diving community. And that's a way, that was a very friendly way to bring Western values into a indigenous culture. Um, <clears throat> Japan's a little bit trickier. Um, in Japan, um, weirdly, the, the sushi chefs are often the people who are talking the most about, uh, well, you're never going to see this fish again because of the overfishing. And so, so they're actually more sustainability conscious than more of the mass ones. And, um, but, it's, but it's really tricky. I, there, there's an incident that I was involved in where uh, a local Japanese Greenpeace duo, two students, uh, found the uh, whaling Japanese research whaling vessel was taking the whale meat, <coughs> research whale meat and selling it on the black market. So they were able to get on board a ship and find a package that was labeled to be sent to a, a commercial vendor. So that was the evidence. And they had <coughs> uh, filed a suit against the, the, the people who were involved in the research uh, uh, vessel. And then the day before the, uh, uh, the court date, um, they raided the Greenpeace office, put them on TV as, as terrorists and trespassers. They arrested the two kids as terrorists, threw them into solitary in one of the really hard prisons where the warden was against it because these were just kids. And somehow they were able to turn the, 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 the prosecuting side into the defendant side on a, a trespassing and terrorism thing. And, and I was very interested, I was a, a friend of the, the, the Greenpeace folks, and no one would talk to Greenpeace because once they were labeled um, terrorists, they, no one wanted to talk to them, so they wouldn't get any airplay. But the really weird thing for me on this was <clears throat> that whole market <clears throat> of illegal whaling meat is de minimis. It's, it's, it's like no money, so there's no, it's not corruption. It's this kind of weird nationalist anger at other people trying to tell the Japanese what to do about their whaling practice. And so it really is a cultural thing. And so I think one of the things that we sort of, and, and this is where stories and information, maybe connecting with the Shinto culture, connecting with the Native American culture, I think it's got to be much more nuanced than coming in the front door through the UN. And, 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 and I, think, I think there's ways to do it, but it, it really is a, a, a yeah. cultural design. Yeah, I agree. It is a cultural design and you need to figure out what is the right way of approaching different cultures. At the same time, personally, I do think that there is the power of having groups that are very activist mm -hmm. because they move the needle in a certain direction. Yeah. So then other groups yeah. can yeah. start the conversation in a more positive way to make the changes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, uh, yeah it's, called it the it's called the radical flank theory, where you've got these guys on the outside. When I was running Creative Commons, Richard Stallman would be going, ah! And I'd say, see, we're not as crazy as those guys. And then they would, they would kind of listen to us. So, yeah. Not so always I, works, but yeah, some no, places but, but it I, does. But, but, I, but I agree. And I think, I think some sort of combination, but, but I think coordination definitely. Yeah. And, and, but, but I think if you can get the general population to start to realize that it's not a cool thing, that, that I think is, is but, but I think that's broadly true. That yeah. includes the conservation stuff, the, 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 the energy stuff. I don't know, is, are there any other? We've got two, so there. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Andrea, I'm from Brazil. I recently joined the Media Lab. And during my master's program, I was studying the Amazon, the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, one thing that strikes me is, as you said, uh, when we are engaging in this kind of interventions, both sides are interested in conserving nature, but with very different worldviews. 
Um, from our side, we come up with a different tools. So we tend to plan the landscape design through satellite from above, while those guys are planning the landscape in the cross-sectional dimension. Um, during my master, as I said, I was studying the intervention of Belo Monte, one of the largest hydroelectric dams, so I'm really talking about a much more aggressive intervention. But what really strikes me is the fact that we don't find any tools for design to mediate these different worldviews. So my question is, when you are working with those communities, what kind of design tools do you find so you can both look and simulate the future and think about the future in a way you can communicate more easily and maybe try to see uh, the same things or related things. And uh, what do you think uh, designers should do to help uh, in this kind of challenge? Now, that is a really interesting question. Um, how it works in reality is that in each of the sites, not even in each of the countries, but in each of the sites, there are people that manage to, to, to make that bridge. That it doesn't come from like, oof. As I mentioned a moment ago, actually, most of the people we work with end up getting to working with in this because they care about other people. So they are like, how can I respect you? How can I do whatever I can do make you grow. The conservation part is the result. And, and we, we might measure things that we care about, but it is not what they care about. And by us caring about what they care about, actually, we achieve also what we want, right? It, I know it is confusing. Sorry for that. Um, what strikes me, and we have been do doing that poorly, and I would love ideas on that, is that whenever I am in the field and I hear these partners of our talk with the communities and get into that, like, what does your future actually, what, what do you want your future to be like? The ways that they work in that way vary greatly. Some people talk about trees that are local, some people talk about fish and their reproduction cycles. It is, it is beautiful. Like, that is one of the things that is amazing about this, the, the diversity of ways of communicating and making sure that what you say other people can understand, and what they say, you understand. Not an answer, but the closest to it. There's one. Actually, that is one of the things that I would love to do, and I always think about that I never end up doing. ¿Qué tal? Hola. Arnaldo, de Venezuela. Pleasure meeting you, and thank you so much, first of all, Margarita, for everything you're doing and the passion you bring into this. So I've been uh, helping out a friend. He's building a startup on uh, how to use rock climbing and, uh, and outdoor sports activities to help, help local communities in uh, different places in the world. And right now, we're focusing on a project called Proyecto Tepuy, focused on Venezuela. So they will be embarking a trip to, to uh, La Gran Sabana, to Canaima, in uh, April next year. So what tip could you give them other than uh, bringing medicine to the local people that are suffering or stuff like this that could help um, make this trip more, more sustainable and try to continue doing uh, projects like this to Venezuela and pro other local communities like this? Talk with them about why they should be proud. Venezuelans are going through so much issues right now. And, and yeah, we work with a local NGO in Venezuela. They <coughs> make miracles, because I don't really know how they make things happen with all of the situation. And it is not only about the medicines or the toilet paper or even the arena pan, right? It is, it is about them remembering why they are great. Like, all the opportunities that are out there, that they don't have to lose hope because they are doing amazing work. And they are actually in one of the nicest and most beautiful countries in the world. And there is a lot to be proud of. So raise that part because then they are going to be like, somebody is seeing us beyond the chaos. And it is not judging us just because right now we have a political situation that is messy, but it's seen beyond that. They're currently struggling going towards illegal mining as, as a solution to su sustain their lives, but 
we need to find other ways to help Oof, them. And sorry, I, I work, I, the partners that work exactly in El Bajo Caura, and all of those communities end up going to the 88 to do all the mining, and half of the people die there, and the other half return very, very sick. And just for community members to see that makes them think twice whether it is actually worth it. Mm -hmm. So also bringing that reality on what actually means to go and do illegal mining in the upper Gouda. And, and maybe, you know, and you're probably doing this, but like you said, you have patterns for success. There are also patterns for exploitation that are very old. And so maybe this is also educating people on these patterns and just saying, look, this is an old trick. Uh, it's a common trick and here's what usually happens and here's a fun number of a community that you can talk to that suffered from it. And I think sharing that may be a helpful thing. Anybody else? Back. Hello. Um, I'm from the Community Biotechnology Initiative here in the Media Lab. And um, I was wondering, um, so there are a lot of... Um, if, you, if I may make the analogy with, uh, for example, historical buildings, there is um, also pretty uh, much a, uh, emphasis on preserving them, oh, I'm sorry. on preserving those buildings, and um, there is sort of even within uh, this discussion about whether or not you should prefer, preserve st um, things in this transition towards more sustainable uh, economy. Um, in terms of energy generation, there are a lot of limitations to preserving something, so sometimes to progress, um, is, is there needs to be some sort of an openness to uh, maybe new technologies, maybe indigenous sort of knowledge to um, give space to, um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm a little nervous, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, basically the question is, is there sort of a place for biotechnology uh, within indigenous cultures to enable them, for example, to not only participate in citizen science projects, but also to um, contribute and to use, for example, microfluidics to test toxins in the environment and to really contribute something in giving back to nature rather than only extracting uh, from nature. Yeah. I can't imagine there is. I think that, that the issue is how to make sure that people understand what it means and what are the implications, so that at the end, it, it is all about, and, and it is about freely deciding, right? Like this, this concept of the free prior informed consent. And it is not only going and talking, but it is also about them seeing what, what does it mean and how is that going to benefit them or affect them, and to see whether they are willing to, to test it out. And, and I think um, some, I don't know how successful it is, but, it, but I, I talked a few years ago with um, Howard Shapiro, who has the, orphan, um, the African Orphan Crops Project. And he works with very talented local uh, uh, crop breeders in Africa and then brings them to UC Irvine and teaches them genetic uh, sequencing to understand what they already know a lot about. So he's giving them a microscope or a lens into something that they know a lot about. So he's augmenting their work. And so they're not having to learn stuff from scratch, but they're using really high tech modern science. Um, and you know, hopefully this will change, but right now Africa has this sort of very negative impression of GMOs for a variety of reasons. So, but you can still sequence and know more about the crops so that the breeding becomes better and, and, and there's distribution. And so I, I think that what's interesting, this gets back to your point about there's a lot of knowledge there. I think what would be neat is to go and look at the local medicine people or the local crop breeders and to figure out what tools would be useful for them um, to make them more effective. Now what would be useful for them? The, the, the fear that many of these communities have is that they have seen a lot of people coming and taking their stuff and then charging them for it. Yeah, right? Yeah. Or, yeah. And that's so, where we can use the lawyers, right? Because yeah, that I is think, where I the lawyers what, are awesome. Know, is, is how but can we... Uh, the lawyers to our side. Yeah. How can we prevent exploitation? Yeah. Right? Um, anybody else? If not, we're actually kind of just about at, out of time. So thank you so much, Margarita. And we hope you will be back to work with us. Yeah. Thank you very much for bearing with me and with Joey. I know that you have to bear with him, <laughs> but with me, I am the new one here. Um, thank you very much. Thanks. And I look forward to getting to know you all more. Thank you.